Acids and bases are probably a subject that you learned for the first time in high school, back when it seemed simple enough. Hydrochloric acid's bad for your skin. Cool. Unfortunately, we have to level up our conceptual understanding of acids and bases if we stand a chance against MCAT questions and eventually in learning acid-base equilibria in the body. Today, I'm helping you take that next step. The first thing that you probably learned in general chemistry about acids and bases was the different definitions of acid and bases. These have historical significance and some of them are more useful in some scenarios than others, but we have to know all of them for the MCAT. So I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. First up is the Arrhenius definition. It says that an acid is a molecule that increases the proton concentration in a solution. Bases increase the concentration of hydroxide in a solution. Full stop. But there are bases like ammonia that do not always increase the hydroxide concentration in a solution. So it's important to know that while ammonia is known as a base, it's not considered an Arrhenius base. The next is probably the most useful definition when thinking about acids and bases, and it's the Bronsted-Lowry definition. According to this theory, an acid increases the proton concentration, which is just like Arrhenius, but a base is something that decreases the proton concentration in a solution. Now ammonia can be considered a Bronsted-Lowry base. The Lewis definition takes it a step further and says that acids are electron acceptors and bases are electron donors. This kind of shuttles into the idea of nucleophiles and electrophiles, which is like extremely important for organic chemistry. But note that a base is not necessarily a nucleophile and an acid is not necessarily an electrophile. There are some important differences with this and I recommend to go to Socratic if you want to like learn more about the differences between nucleophilicity and basicity and stuff like that. So on the MCAT, unless otherwise specified, think of acids and bases in the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Now to the meat of this conversation, how do we predict what's an acid and what's a base? When you see a chemical equation, you're going to want to focus on are there protons moving? That's going to give you a good indication that it is an acid-base reaction. Then you want to see what is losing a proton across the arrow. That's probably going to be your acid. What is accepting that electron will be your base. Now on the product side of your reaction, you will see the conjugate base and acid. So whatever was your acid on the reactant side will become your conjugate base on the product side once it loses that proton and vice versa for your base and your conjugate acid. A little caveat here is that if you have a strong acid, by definition, its conjugate base will be weak. This makes sense if you think about it, because if you have a strong acid, that means it really, really wants to get rid of its proton. So once it finally does lose that proton and becomes a conjugate base, it's not going to want to take it back. So you have a weak base there. In this case, saying something's weak is analogous to saying that it is stable. Stable meaning it's not going to want to react. So weak, stable, same thing here. Now how to rank something like acidity and basicity. So for something to be a strong acid, it's got to have a stable conjugate base. So we kind of already talked about how for something to be a strong acid, it has to have a weak or a stable conjugate base. And it makes logical sense if you think about an acid, once it loses that proton, it's going to leave a negative charge. And just a negative charge sitting there on the edge of a molecule is probably not going to be very stable. It's probably going to want to react. So what makes things more stable in that case? There are two things, and the first one is induction. Induction is basically when an electronegative atom that is somewhere else on the molecule pulls some of that electric charge, that negative charge, towards itself. Now this isn't like a full theft of the negative charge, like the negative charge still stays on the same atom that it was on before, but the other electronegative atom is going to kind of just pull that electron density, which partially spreads it out over the entire molecule. This is going to stabilize the negative charge. I'll show you this example. So here I've kind of shown this molecule as it loses its proton. So this would be the acid and this would be the conjugate base. So in this case, fluorine is actually going to be the one that is um, introducing these inductive effects. 
So what induction actually means is that fluorine is going to kind of pull some of this negative charge towards itself, which kind of, you can see, would spread it out across most of the molecule. So if we're comparing this acid to this acid, the one with the fluorine on it is going to be more stable because inductive effects means that the resultant negative charge is going to be spread out more across the molecule than if the fluorine wasn't there. So this one would be more acidic than this one. So to recap, if you see on your acid an electronegative atom that could pull electron density away from the negative charge that the acid's gonna have once it loses its proton, that makes your conjugate base more stable, less likely to react, and thus weaker, which in turn means that your acid is going to be stronger. You may have to listen to that twice. It's not that I don't think you guys are smart, but it took me like years to understand what this was saying. And we're basically going to build off the same reasoning for the next thing that we talk about. So you make an acid stronger by making its conjugate base more stable. The other thing that determines stability is resonance. Resonance is the advantageous placement of double bonds in a molecule so that you can move the negative charge around the molecule. So let's use the same example we were using before. So here on the right, we have our conjugate base with our negative charge sitting on it. That negative charge wants to move around. And if you'll remember, you can move these around. So you can make the negative charge pop onto that bond that's going towards the oxygen and then push these up and give the negative charge to that other oxygen. Then you end up with this. And I know you're probably thinking, Maggie, isn't that the literal exact same molecule? And yes, it is. The point is that you can move this negative charge, like physically full theft, move it across multiple atoms within a molecule. Resonance is the reason why carboxylic acids are always so acidic because their organization is such that always lends itself to resonance. Resonance is also a much stronger stabilizer than inductive effects. So if you have to choose between a molecule that can do induction versus one that can do resonance, the one that can do resonance will be a much stronger acid. So the, the comparable uh, molecule that does not have resonance would be like just this alcohol here on the bottom. And you can see that once the negative charge is on that oxygen, it can't really go anywhere via resonance. It still has the inductive effects through this fluorine, uh, but it's not going to be near as acidic as the carboxylic acid on the top. Now to the boring part, which is the math. We're going to discuss Ka and pKa. Ka is the equilibrium constant. So like every other equilibrium constant, you set up an equation of the acid dissociating, then divide the concentration of products by the concentration of the reactants, and boom, you have Ka. A large Ka means a strong acid, and that makes sense, right? Because if you have a strong acid, it's probably going to dissociate almost entirely in solution, and so you're going to have a lot more products than you would reactants. pKa is the negative log of the Ka. Chemists use pKa, I assume, because Ka can be like unmanageably high. So taking the log of it puts it into reasonable numbers that we can think about. Now taking the negative of that number ends up meaning that the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. And I don't know why they take the negative of it, whatever. pKa also feeds directly into a discussion about the pH scale. And this is the way you really need to think about pKa um, when you're thinking about biological systems, when you're thinking about it on the MCAT, when you're thinking about it in med school. The pKa of a specific acidic proton is the pH at which above it, that atom will lose its proton and below it, it will keep its proton. So if the proton on a carboxylic acid of an amino acid has a pKa of about two, then that means that above a pH of two, that carboxylic acid is going to lose its proton. Below a pH of two, it's going to keep its proton. Okay, I think we have officially come full circle on acids and bases. It's important to understand acids and bases because they're super high yield on the MCAT and later on in medical school. If you like hearing about the most high yield parts of those heavily tested topics on the MCAT, then you will love our new ebook. 
John and I spent like forever like making this book and we really hope that you guys enjoy it. Uh, We're just going through a few tweaks and it will be up on our website soon and we will post the link down in the description when it comes out. As always, I thank you so much for watching and let us know what you want to see in the comments. Bye.